Okay, good evening everyone. We're back again for Amateur Astronomers Incorporated. Um, we're having our weekly Friday nights at uh, home presentations and AAI makes its home at Mill William Miller Sperry Observatory on the campus of Union County College in Cranford, New Jersey. Uh, and since the observatory is closed at this time, we are holding our weekly presentations online. And our presenter this evening is AAI member Jim Nordhausen. Uh, he's been a member of AAI for several years. He maintains our two telescopes at Sperry Observatory. Uh, he's a qualified observer, meaning he can operate the telescopes at the observatory. And he does a lot of astrophotography. He's given presentations before here um, at uh, AAI. The title of his presentation is Extreme Astronomy, Science from the Bottom of the World. And with that, Jim, please begin. Thank you, Mary. Well, before I begin, let me introduce myself briefly. Um, I am Technical Committee Chairman of Amateur Astronomers Incorporated, as Mary may have mentioned. Uh, my interest in the Antarctic program began when I saw an ad in my college alumni magazine that simply said, South Pole Machinist. So being a machinist tool and die maker, I was curious, clicked on it, and I actually almost applied for the 11 month winter over position, which would have been basically repairman for all of these instruments you see in the picture here, the South Pole Telescope, BICEP, uh, the Keck Array, uh, except I came to my senses and realized I didn't want to be a winter rover liability, medically speaking. Uh, my daughter was entering college, financial issues. So, uh, and they hadn't, I had no idea what the pay scale was. So uh, I decided not to complete my application, but it got me interested in all the things that go on down there that nobody ever really hears about. So in a previous talk, I covered what goes on at McMurdo station on the coast. This one's concentrating on the non uh, cosmic microwave background radiation work that's going on at Admonson uh, Scott South Pole Station. So with that, let us begin. Okay, now extreme astronomy, by that I mean astronomy in extreme environments where we wouldn't really be sticking around long unless we really have to. I mean, the problem is the Earth's atmosphere uh, is only transparent at certain wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum and it absorbs a lot of the other radiation in all other frequencies. So here is a basically a overview of the radio of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Here is uh, visible light. You can see not all of it is transparent. Radio waves are fairly transparent. Everything else is blocked out and you need to get above the components that are absorbing them like out into space. Like here's the Hubble Space Telescope and here's another instrument flying above everything or come as close to it as you can. Now, the next slide only covers the point from here over to here, uh, and it shows you what is doing a lot of the absorbing. So you see water vapor is the biggest contributor to opacity in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide uh, contributes some. Raleigh scattering from blue on down is a major component. Um, so what do we do about this? Water vapor, we can try to do something about. You can try to get to places where there isn't much of it. So you can observe from space, or you can try to get to as dry a place as you can. Now, satellites are expensive. Everything has to be proven. Everything has to work right the first time. Or unlike the Hubble, most satellites, you can't go up and have a do-over and upgrade instruments. So you can either also do balloon astronomy. They do a lot of that in Antarctica because of the uh, polar vortex just sends them around a circle on the continent or the high deserts of Chile or Hawaii or Antarctica. Conditions there are very ripe for certain kinds of work there. Now, Antarctica is very large. Um, this, uh, bl the black and white dots are on the United States map. This is uh, the Colorado base, the airport and LAX we take off of, and this is Washington, DC. Now, oops, sorry. Uh, now the flight from McMurdo to South Pole Station is 900 miles from yellow cross to yellow cross. Why do we do astronomy there? 
uh, extremely low precipitable water vapor. Uh, it's much better than at high desert regions in, in uh, Chile. Uh, continuous observations can be made on long time scales because everything just circles around at the same elevation. Um, there's not much temperature fluctuation during the day because you're either in all day or all night or all twilight. There's not much infrared noise. Uh, Altaz mounts perform as equatorials. That's a little side benefit of observing on the pole. Now, a little bit of history of how we got there. Uh, the US geophysical, international geophysical year uh, sparked a lot of interest in Antarctica. I'm told that when we flew in in 1956, I think two days later, the Russians rolled in on tracked vehicles. So we basically beat them to the South Pole and got control of the operations there. Uh, in 1956, Martin A. Pomerantz was invited to Antarctica and he sees the potential of the continent for a wide range of endeavors for precisely the reasons I uh, was getting into. Uh, cosmic ray detectors were the first thing to go in and that began the beginning of high energy astronomy. So McMurdo base is on the coast. So all research begins there. Everything comes into there, all supplies. The ANSMET is based there, the Antarctic search for meteorites. All the balloon launch operations are there. They have cosmic ray equipment there. Uh, actually, I think that was removed and went to a Korean base on the other side of the continent. But um, Everything else still holds. And they have the lowest precipitable water vapor on Earth, which makes it extremely good for terahertz observations and submillimeter band. So, uh, and low aerosol content, low light scattering. As you can see, the sun is at low altitude behind that person's thumb. And up in here, all these little dots are stars in the sky. So, it's a great place to observe from theoretically. Uh, so, okay, the National Science Foundation funds everything. The USAP is the United States Antarctic Program. So if it can't be done anywhere on Earth, they will find a way to fund it there. Um, everything that goes into there is covered by the US Antarctic Program. They say for comfort's sake, bring your own socks and underwear. Uh, you're allowed to bring other items in, personal items, uh, under 25 pounds of your own gear. Now the seasons at the pole are winter and summer, basically. Summer is only a three or four month season, and that's when all the work gets done. Continuous daylight, equipment maintenance. Uh, Gil Jeffers, member of uh, UACNJ and the NJIT group, uh, has spent many summer overs there maintaining uh, equipment for NJIT. They have space weather observing automated uh, observatories there out in the field. We have to fly from observatory to observatory doing maintenance. So here he is getting ready to bed down for the night in broad daylight. <laughs> so the summer is a busy, busy time. Everything must be completed quickly. You're reserving workshop space. You have to time everything around the airplane flights. Bad weather delays you everything gets delayed. Okay, so everything has to be done by the end of February because that's when the last flight leaves out. There's a time limit to when these uh, HC-130s can travel be or the, when they land, the skis get frozen to the runway, runway maintenance becomes a problem, fueling becomes a problem because the fuel hoses freeze solid and don't flex. Uh, that's a lot of the issues why they're isolated for the complete winter. So, First flight, so last flight goes out, it's bye-bye, we're all alone, what do we do? Let's all get together and have a Thing marathon. Let's watch every version of the Thing back to back. So uh, that's, that's the first little bit of fun they have. So how did we get there? Okay, everything goes through Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, after that, everything is out, they're outfitted with everything they need for in terms of clothing. Always bring a swimsuit, more on that later. It's kind of like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where you always have to bring a towel. Uh, so everything goes through McMurdo, as I said. In the Christchurch distribution center, they have all the cold weather gear, all the boots, all the backpacks for field work, like I said, everything you're gonna need because 
you're not going to be able to buy this kind of stuff anywhere else. So you fly out of California, LAX, you go to Christchurch, and everything goes either by air and lands on uh, Pegasus Field on the ice at McMurdo or comes in by boat through McMurdo. And then everything's airlifted on those HC-130 planes to the South Pole from McMurdo from there. So the problem with all of that is, is um, there's not that many of those ski mounted HC-130s left. Every couple of years, they lose one to a crash. I'm not sure what they're down to, but uh, eventually that is gonna be an issue. And it's the Air National Guard who pilots those. So let's give them a big round of applause for getting all of this done. Now, here we are in the continent of Antarctica. The other way you can get there that they've been using more popularly is a land drag. Uh, the red line that goes from here to here is the route of the land drag. And they're using that so they don't have to do so many flights. They have all these caterpillar vehicles and they basically just haul everything on skis. They have all these uh, fuel bladders filled with diesel fuel that they're dragging in just to it takes a lot of fuel to fly everything at those high altitudes into the South Pole from McMurdo. We're at 10,000 feet elevation. Now, this is the last, basically here's 88 degrees south and 89 degrees south coming into the South Pole. This is a little overview of the area. Um, everything down there at the station is divided into sectors depending on the kind of research. There's a steady wind that comes from the higher elevations in Antarctica and flows this way. So they have the clean air sector here where it's all clean air coming in. You're not allowed to fly aircraft below 2000 meters here, et cetera, come in by snowmobile or any kind of pollution because they're trying to measure air quality in as pristine an environment as possible. Um, we'll zoom in and the other sectors will start popping up. Uh, they do seismology research here. Not allowed to travel over land on there because they have a lot of seismic detectors there. That's why they call that the quiet sector. The downwind sector is where all the flights have come in and out of. That's basically the way into the airstrip here. And the dark sector is where they do all of the uh, research on CMB work, and that's where Ice Cube is located and uh, most of the instrumentation. Now this hexagon here is where the instrument ice cube, which I'll talk about later is located. This little outline here is where the old pole station from 1956 lies buried under the snow. Um, here's a little better view. Here's the airstrip coming in. Down here, we have a lot of above ground storage. There's kind of like a campground for overflow of workers there. Uh, here's the uh, dark sector over here. Over here, we have the Morris A. Pomerantz Observatory where the Keck Array is located, the dark, uh, dark sector laboratory where the South Pole Telescope is located, and here's the Ice Cube building. Every day they have to, and here's the new pole station. It's like a one kilometer walk from here to there to get to work in the morning on your eight hour shift. And they do have tourist accommodations. So you fly in as a tourist, they put you in tents camping up here. You're allowed to walk down to the visitor center up here, but the actual US uh, Antarctic program uh, property up here is strictly off limits unless you have special invitation. So that's the luxury accommodations if you spend the $40,000 or so to go as a tourist. I highly recommend getting a job there instead if you want to see Antarctica. And there's the uh, amazing visitor center. I have a photo inside somewhere, but uh, I didn't post it to the uh, show. Now, here's what you see when you arrive. This is the first flight coming in for the season in October, 2006. The contrail going across here is the exhaust from the fuel generation. They burn jet fuel because it's nice high octane, a uh, lot of horsepower for the buck. ARO is the uh, Atmospheric Research Observatory because up in this direction is the clean air sector. Uh, over here is the quiet sector and over here is the dark sector where they do all the astrophysics research. Now it's called the dark sector because it's radio quiet so it doesn't interfere with the instrumentation. Now, 
here's another view from the opposite side. Here's the Morse Pomerantz Observatory ice cube over here. And these are actually the operations of the ice drills going on, drilling boreholes two kilometers down in the ice with hot water drills for ice cube. And here the new South Pole station is under construction before they put the skin on. Okay, a little history. South Pole Station was originally designed as a temporary structure. Uh, it's basically square box-like buildings, the standard military navy buildings they used. Um, it, they got, was getting buried by snow. They built a little cap on it to extend the top above the snow line. That got buried. They extended it above. Eventually, it finally got buried, and with all the poor construction, became structurally unsound. Uh, they built the dome to replace it. And uh, then they demolished the old dome after they uh, went down, pulled out what other what useful stuff they could find down there. They were trying to compact the snow above the old station to build a campground there. And the heavy equipment fell in. They send a truck to, re uh, to pull out the first one. That one fell in. So nobody was hurt. Everybody was able to climb out the windows. They pulled everything out. They blew it all up with explosives and they packed everything down and let it fill with drifting snow so that it will never be a hazard again. Now, here's a map of the old pole station. Originally, all these individual buildings were above ground. They started building covered walkways and expanding it as they could uh, with whatever resources they had. And that is the site where the original movie, The Thing, happened. This was under park construction. Uh, these were the original buildings here. They're trying to build covered walkways before uh, winter begins. This is the dome that replaced the old station. As you can see, it's a simple geodesic dome, but as you can see, it's having problems getting buried too already. Inside, it's not much better than the original station, the same kind of windowless buildings, um, not much of a capacity for maybe 20 winter overs and getting cramped small, getting buried again. So they decided to build a new station and they started construction in 2001, dedication was in 2007. Now, every station they had, had a bar in it called Club 90 or 90 South. Uh, and they all had saunas in them, hence one of the reasons for bringing a swimsuit when you go to uh, South Pole. Sauna is a very popular place to be if you're coming in from the outside. Now here's this new South Pole station here under construction before the skin was applied. Here's the old dome. You can see it's getting buried deeper and deeper. They did dismantle the old dome fully after the new station was online. So that no longer exists. Uh, here's a little view of what's inside. Down here, they have a two-story gymnasium where they do entertainment. Uh, people bring musical instruments, they have concerts. Taking care of the personnel there is very important to the uh, Antarctic program because these people risk their lives every day and they take good care of them. Um, it also, uh, everything that was used to build this building had to fly into in one of these HC-130 planes. So it took an awful lot of flights to get there. So this is the most carbon intensive building on the planet. There's a lot of fuel in 950 flights. So this is what it looks like all finished. You'll notice the strange design. It's elevated on struts. And this surface here is an airfoil. It's designed like an upside down wing so that it accelerates the air going under the building and scours the snow away so it will not get buried. And they also added a feature where all of these supports that it's on can be lifted up in case the snow level does rise. They can jack it up and jack it up and jack it up. And it greatly increases the useful life of the facility. Now, this one can fit 150 people in the summer and 50 to 60 in the winter. Uh, in the summer, extra sleepovers in summer camp because they normally have 200, 250 people on the summer cruise. Now, the winter room's far more spacious. You get an extra foot, 8 by 10 instead of 7 by 10. So they take care of their winter overs. Most of the summer over rooms are closed down and used for cold storage during the winter season. So they have a lot of activities going on. They have a greenhouse in, inside there that's uh, 
they do, I think they upgraded the greenhouse recently with new LED grow lights and everything. So they have a better supply of uh, what they call freshies going to the kitchen. Fresh vegetables are a very sought after thing there because, uh, you know, you're in the middle of Antarctica. <laughs> About three weeks after the last plane leaves is when all the fresh food runs out and you're limited to frozen food for the rest of the season. So it's a nice place to relax in there. It's anybody can go into the uh, greenhouse and relax, although one person is usually there who's assigned to taking care of it. Now they have a few fun activities, a race around the world where they have a, a course of around a mile long that goes all the way around the station and passes through all the different time zones, um, musical performances. Uh, most everything is sanctioned by the National Science Foundation, except the 300 Club. Um, <laughs> even though it's not officially sanctioned, a lot of people participate in it. So what it is, is when temperature outside gets to minus 100 degrees, uh, everybody piles into the sauna, jacks it up to 200 degrees, um, then they run outside, usually naked around the ceremonial pole, and then come back inside, back into the sauna to warm up again. Now, only twice in recorded history has that ever happened in daylight, the first time here in 1982, and once again in uh, 1912. Uh, and someone was thoughtful enough to have these little patches made up. Isn't that cute? Now, the ceremonial pole is always a good spot for lighthearted creative photography. Um, these people got creative and uh, were uh, risking their skin at minus five to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit for this uh, shot for New Year's, uh, January 2nd, 2009. Um, it's an international crew down there. These people from, are from all around the world. So New Year's 2009, National Science Foundation sanctioned something very interesting. They uh, dug a pit in the ice, four feet deep, 40 feet by 40 feet, lined it with pipe, uh, with tarps, uh, filled it with recirculating hot water that they had on hand from the hot water drills for ice cube. And they had a 60 person open air hot tub for New Year's Eve. So they're in a construction zone. So hard hats were mandatory. Everything else went. So uh, now the geographic pole is a little different than a ceremonial pole. The fact that the uh, station sits on a glacier and slides 30 feet a year uh, means that the actual physical geophysical north uh, south pole needs to be remarked every year. So the south pole machinist, when he's not uh, repairing uh, the other equipment, uh, has a lot of free time on his hands. So every year they have a first a design contest. All the people vote on a design and then the south pole machinist has to execute that design in metal and other uh, materials. So here's 10 years of the geographical markers that were machined by people uh, in the position I was considering going. So some are very creative. That was the pole telescope. You have a nice sextant there, some etchings of Edmonton and Scott. That's some glass etched with Antarctica on it. Little Saturn action. And I think that's the South Pole Telescope in the background, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. Now, a little history. Uh, I mentioned Martin Pomerantz before. Uh, I don't know why I said Morris earlier. Uh, he was the first person there with the cosmic ray detectors. He did optical work there for solar work. Uh, he was the first person to have a solar observatory there. And they did work on, on helioseismology. And they also started the first CMB work there. They had uh, basically a two pixel telescope uh, looking to see what the angular resolution of the CMB variations were. And um, that'll be the subject of a future talk. Now, um, the in appreciation for him, the first observatory down there was named after him, the Martin Pomerantz uh, Observatory or MAPO. Now here he is with the first solar telescope in 1978. It's the first funded astronomy project in Antarctica. And Adam Smith started a little bit after that. 
Now you have uninterrupted observations of the sun. All you have to do is rotate this heliostat around and around. And, and the angle changes so slightly day by day that uh, you can get a full day's observation without any, observa uh, without any uh, changes. So 150 hours of continuous data were collected and a lot of analysis followed. So they thought it worthwhile building, building a bigger solar telescope. So this one, the National Solar Observatory uh, sent down and was tested in the 80, 80, 81 season. It had some issues, um, some more success later that year, and then they decided to build the bigger one. As you can see from the instrument, um, light is reflected down here, down here, down at the bottom, back up to the top, and back down here where they have the sensors. So they uh, decided to use a more traditional approach on the next version. And they just went with a heliostat up top, a long tube down, and then a long tube horizontally that goes all the way into the observing building. I believe it's an F100 instrument. Um, so uh, it was bigger and it, this performed for many seasons on site in what they called Pomerantz land, which was a couple of kilometers away from, uh, from South Pole Station. I never did find it on a map. I was searching, uh, they don't really have a map of it. And there's some new solar research going on. Um, this telescope uh, is prototype. Uh, I haven't found much information on this project, but uh, there was installation in 2016, and it's supposed to take high resolution images at a sun every five seconds in different wavelengths. So they're trying to map gravity waves in the sun with this. Now, optical astronomy was tested with mixed results. Theoretically, there should be stable air, but there's something called the catabatic wind. Um, because there's a big boundary layer of continuously moving, swirling air that's coming down from higher elevations. So that is a problem. You have to get above that. There were proposals for building telescopes on top of 30 meter platforms, but you can imagine how stable that will be with a constant wind buffeting it. Uh, infrared astronomy was done too, but that was under the auspices of the uh, Tara, which was doing all the CMB work, so that'll be the subject of a future talk. Uh, cosmic ray work was done early on, and it expanded with an instrument called SPACE. There's always cool acronyms, you got to remember that. Uh, you can't get funded without a good acronym. Uh, so that was studying uh, cosmic rays coming down, and uh, it was replaced by Space 2 in 95. They just increased the number of detector modules. And it was working with another instrument uh, called Amanda. But here's a space detector from the air. All these little things are the little cosmic ray detectors. And here is the central command station where they're gathering all the data, which would later become the center for Ice Cube. Uh, so later on, when IceCube was installed, they used these as detectors, as discriminators to help eliminate um, detections that were coming from above. They wanted to basically uh, to, for eliminating false positive signals in as many ways as they could. So Amanda, the Antarctic muon and neutrino detector array uh, began that uh, had under the ice, they would drill down and put detectors in there. And it was basically a mini test bed for ice cube. So it was installed in 96 to 97. Space was used as a detector for the top as a more discrimination. And um, they did a map of high energy neutrinos in the sky based on where the detections were. Um, I don't really know what the map means, but that's from one of their publication papers, and it looks kind of interesting. Now, Ice Cube did a lot better work, so not, nothing is wasted at the South Pole. Amanda finished its project life, and the detectors were reused and repurposed into Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope. So it's called Ice Cube because it uses one cubic kilometer of ice as the neutrino detector. It's 
the ice under high pressure here is very clear, very transparent. So what they do is they take these hot water drills, they drill these holes all the way down. Um, and on the, in the bottom one kilometer, they string these, uh, these little balls on them called DOMs, the digital optical modules. And they're, then they get refrozen into the ice. Um, so when a neutrino goes through the ice and crashes head on with the proton or neutron, they, the muons that are uh, released uh, emit a little blink of blue light called Chernikov radiation. Now these digital optical modules are there to detect the radiation and time where they're coming from and they can do sort of like tracing analysis where they come through. That, that's the basic premise of the detector. So the hot water drills drilled through the ice, little statistics here, each hole 48 hours to drill, 11 hours to deploy, and 4,800 gallons of fuel to heat the water to drill each hole. So there are a lot of holes drilled there, and uh, but it's fully deployed in 2010 detects cosmic rays, neutrinos, all kinds of things, but they're looking for particularly high energy neutrinos. So they finally had detection. Um, these lights represent the uh, energies of the light that was detected by the digital optical modules in intensity and uh, the path and duration. I'm not sure the color coding, but it has to indicate something with where they were coming from and where they're going. So the first three high energy ones, they uh, nicknamed Bert, Ernie, and Big Bird, because it's had this big explosion in the middle here. So the, the energies were 1.0, 1.1, and 2.2 peta electron volts, which is an enormous amount of energy in a little tiny particle. Um, there was one detected earlier, which I think they called Dr. Strange Pork, but it didn't have the energy levels of these three. I think they did one or two higher energy detections since then, but I wasn't able to find much information to update this before then. So they had, here's where they were tracing all their high energy events as coming from. They haven't really noticed any statistically high clusterings, a uh, few more from this area, but this is probably near the galactic center. So that's not unsurprising. Uh, okay, now Ice Cube plans on expanding. They have not done so yet, but um, this is the original Ice Cube and they plan on expanding it to 10 square kilometers of surface area yielding a 10 cubic kilometer detected detector. Part of the problem with all these expansion projects is power. There's a limited amount of generating capacity at South Pole Station. All of these projects are vying for the same kilowatts. Um, so uh, that may prevent uh, Ice Cube Gen 2 from actually deploying unless some other experiments go offline. So here's the red hexagon is the original Ice Cube. This green section here has not been deployed yet, but it's uh, something they plan on uh, installing called Pingu. It's a more low energy infill, they call it. And it's going to be a high concentration of detectors. And uh, they say by using neutrino tomography, they'll be able to measure the composition of the Earth's core. That's the main uh, end game of this. And it's also could be used for uh, solar wind dark matter detection and um, some other kinds of interesting things. There's a group in Germany who's working on this. Uh, they're still publishing. So they're still pushing for full installation of the components. Now the Ascarian radio, radar array is something else that takes advantage of the Ascarian effect. Not only Chernenkov radiation is emitted, but certain uh, radio waves are emitted when uh, neutrinos uh, uh, crash into the ice. So uh, the balloon experiment in NIDA was a test bed for the instrumentation, but they deployed a couple detector strings, which are relatively shallow in the ice. Um, 
I researched this to see if they upgraded anything yet. The current situation is these three orange ones are still planned for 2014, 15, like the James Webb telescope. But once again, I think it's a project that's vying for more power. Um, they're still publishing, they're still gathering data and analyzing it from the first three strings they have deployed. But there's a vortex cone of uh, radio waves that's emitted when an interaction occurs and the strings of radar uh, radio detectors uh, have a little polarization to them so they can detect where the signals are coming from and uh, analyze it in that way. That's kind of why they wanted a multi-string larger detector so they could do more accurate analysis. So that's it for the most of the talk for this uh, talk. I will be doing a talk in the future mainly concentrating with PARA, that's the Center for Astrophysical Research in Antarctica, which was a collective of CMB experiments and other experiments run by the University of Chicago, which included BICEP, the South Pole Telescope, uh, DAISY, Python, COBRA, and a bunch of other instrumentation. So this is the South Pole Telescope, which uh, was under construction in 20, 2007 still and is now on its third set of detectors. Remember what I said is about how you can't upgrade satellite instrumentation? Well, the detectors are in this box right here. Uh, the receiver cabin, that's where all the cryostats are located. And you can lower this down onto the top of the control room here and work on everything in a nice warm environment if you need to change things out. Now they had one set of detectors, which they're studying the CZ effect with, um, the second set of detectors with more uh, pixels also had polarization features to it. The third set of detectors, the uh, SPT3G went online a few years ago. And I think they're reaching the limit of resolution with the instrument. So unless they have some very new technology that they wanna add, I think that's gonna be it for the South Pole Telescope. This is a look inside the detect detector array. It, the incoming light from the main uh, uh, mirror oops, from the main mirror comes in through this window. This is the secondary mirror. Everything in here is filled with liquid nitrogen that's operating below one degree Kelvin through this pulse tube refrigeration unit down here. And then it goes up to where the chip is here. This is a cross section of the uh, second detector they had installed. Now the morning commute, everybody who works out there, they walk a kilometer each way into the station and the instrument BICEP, which did the B-mode polarization detection that turned out to be dust in the galaxy, uh, was located up here. Uh, this is all nice, warm, cozy area inside here, all at room temperature. And here's the South Pole telescope parked in the docked position. So I'd like to thank the following for uh, helping me out in this presentation. National Science Foundation, of course, none of this would be possible without them. Uh, the Bartol Instrument, where the late Dr. Martin A. Pomerantz was from, uh, they got the ball rolling. University of Chicago, who's listing for South Pole Machinist, got me interested in this first place. Gil Jeffers, who was trying to push me into applying for that job. Uh, my wife, Sue, for putting up with me while researching this, and the members of AAI for their enthusiasm and support. A lot of the research was done at this website, southpolestation.com. As it says here, it's one-stop shopping for complete history, photos, and everything pole-related. Uh, they have links to everything, just about every photo. If you click on it, it'll lead you to a link to somewhere else. Uh, University of Wisconsin runs IceCube, so their website has anything you want to find out about IceCube. Um, and special thanks to the men, women, cooks, carpenters, researchers, administrators, and everybody who gives of themselves to make all this happen in the most inhospitable location on Earth. And remember, our tax dollars fund the basic, best basic science in the world. Thank you very much. Now, are there any questions? Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, yes, does anybody have any questions? You can put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So far, we don't. I don't see any. Okay. 
Jim, I, I guess I do have one. You had a, a, a um, slide that showed the sun. Of course, it was low in the horizon, but there were some stars. I was wondering how that is possible to have. Well, there's, um, there's not that much aerosol component in the air. So the Raleigh, uh, not much Raleigh uh, scattering from dust and particulates. Um, and also, I mean, the sun was low in the horizon. You're at 10,000 foot elevation. Um, there's, there's a number of number of reasons, but uh, I don't know what the exposure was on the picture, but uh, let's see if I can go back to that slide. Uh, It was uh, kind of faint. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what's up here, but there's, yeah, a lot of stars yeah. up here. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. We do have a couple questions, Steve. I mean, um, Jim, they're coming in now. Stephen, Stephen asks, how deep is, is it to the bedrock? Two kilometers. How many? I'm sorry, how many kilometers? Two kilometers. Two kilometers? Okay. Yep. They deploy, the ice cube is deployed right down to the bedrock. Um, Nancy asks, how much does it snow there a year? I am not sure. Most of it is drifting snow because there's so little water vapor in the air. It doesn't really, I mean, it all precipitates out as it's blowing in from other areas due to swirling atmospheric conditions. Okay. Um, Ray asks, from where are the Air National Guard crews based? Yeah, I'm not really sure, but I know the United States. Uh, if you go to that southpolestation.com, there's a lot more information on that. Okay. Uh, Cliff has a couple of questions. He says he's curious about the optics of the 10 meter telescope. Could you go over those two slides again? Sure. I believe it's a Gregorian system, if that's what got you puzzled. Um, This slide, right? Um, what exactly is the question? You have the incoming light coming here. You have a, a cold stop to block the heat. Um, you have a secondary mirror here, and there's a corrector lens here, and the instrument's focal plane is up here. Um, he was curious about the optics. Uh, of the detector or about the, I know the, uh, I think they have some self-correcting self features on the panels on the surface of the, the primary mirror so they can always maintain the line and self-correct for sag and all that. I think they use lasers or something with that, but uh, I might be getting more research on that in the future. I finally downloaded some papers that were off limits to me. Thank you, Jeremy Carlo. <laughs> Um, and Cliff does ask, where is the primary? Oh, um, this is the primary mirror here. Oh, okay. and we, uh, originally, they planned on having a big metal cone around it, like bicep, but they realized they didn't need it 100%. They tried it completely open, then they found they needed something. So they added these little side wings as ground shields to prevent uh, reflected radiation off of the snow from interfering with their measurements. Okay. And then he asks, um, you might have already answered this, I'm not sure, is the second slide of the telescope just the detector secondary system? Yes, that's what's located, yeah, Oops, sorry, that, that's what's located in this area down here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, everything's in a cryostat so from the secondary on down. Now, uh, the SPT-3G detector actually has an extra mirror in there. So it has a tertiary mirror located up here, and then the detector is on the bottom down here. So it has another reflection to point things downward so they could fit a larger detector array down there. Okay, and Cliff responded, he says, understand. All right, um, 
I just, if anybody, I don't think there's any more questions. I'll wait a moment or two to see if anybody does put any more questions in. Um, and if not, I want to thank you, Jim, very much. Very interesting. And wish everyone, wish everyone clear skies.